Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mark Vasquez. I am the IEEE Tech Ethics Program Manager and I'd like to welcome you all to Facing the Truth, Benefits and Challenges of Facial Recognition. Uh, this latest installment in the IEEE Tech Ethics Conversation Series will address the benefits and challenges of facial recognition and related biometrics technologies. Uh, before we kick things off and before I introduce you to our esteemed panel, I just want to mention a few Housekeeping notes for all of you watching online. Uh, most of the hour will be moderated discussion between uh, the panelists uh, gathered here with us, and that will be followed by a Q&A period at the end. We will be taking Q&A from registrants who submitted questions during the registration process, but we will also take questions uh, from you throughout the hour if you take uh, advantage of either the chat function, which is probably on this side of your screens, uh, either the chat function or the Q&A function, either one, if you have some questions that you want to pose to the panelists at the end, we'll get to as many of those as we can. Uh, so throughout the hour, make sure to use those two functionalities. Uh, it may be best from a viewing perspective for each of you to select the grid feature, the gallery feature uh, in your WebEx window. That way you'll see all of the panelists on screen at the same time. And finally, today's session will be recorded uh, and is being, uh, it will be posted online in the coming weeks. So in case you've missed anything or in case you want to share it with your colleagues, uh, it will be available on our website uh, within the coming weeks. So with that said, uh, let me introduce you briefly to our panelists for today, and then we'll jump right into the discussion. Uh, let me start with Michael King. Uh, Michael is a research scientist and associate professor with Florida Institute of Technology's Harris Institute for Short Information. Uh, prior to joining academia, uh, Dr. King served for more than 10 years as a scientific research and program management professional in the U.S. intelligence community, during which time he created, directed, and managed research portfolios covering a broad range of topics related to biometrics and identity. So welcome, Michael. Uh, Katina Michael is a professor at Arizona State University and a public interest technology advocate who emphasizes privacy and security by design. She has been funded by the Australian Research Council in the field of location-based services regulation, has been a board member of the Australian Privacy Foundation since 2008, and is a board member of the IEEE Society on the Social Implications of Technology. So welcome, Katina. And then finally, last but not least, uh, Richa Singh, who is a professor at IIT Jodhpur, India and an adjunct professor at both IIIT Delhi and West Virginia University. Her areas of interest are pattern recognition, machine learning, and biometrics. And she's also the vice president of publications of the IEEE Biometrics Council. So welcome, Richa. So we have for you, uh, in case you haven't noticed, a rather diverse and um, international panel today. Uh, we have uh, Michael, who is, is based in, on the East Coast here in the U.S. We have Katina, who is based at Arizona State, but also uh, in Australia. And in fact, she is a dialing in from Australia now. And Richa, who is with us from India. So we have a, a pretty well, um, we have pretty good coverage, let's put, put it that way, uh, globally at this point in this conversation. And what I want to do is I want to start um, by asking each of the panelists to tell us a bit about your involvement in this space, in the, in the facial recognition and biometric space. Sort of what brings you to this conversation? And what are some of those sort of key seeds that you want to plant for our discussion for today moving forward? Uh, I'm just going to go in the order that I see you on the screen. So we'll start with Katina and then go to Michael and then Risha. So Katina, if you could start. Thanks, Mark. Well, what an honor to be here uh, this evening. How did I get involved in facial recognition? Well, I finished a PhD on automatic identification innovation and I was looking at which identification system would actually be the most lucrative or attractive down the track. And of course, there was an environment of coexistence there, which led to a, a full text volume, but also looking at facial recognition as not just an identification system. In fact, facial recognition gives us more. It gives us identity, it gives us location, and it gives us condition. It can give us a location by viewing the backdrop of where the face is situated. It can give us somebody's condition by the way we look at their mood or emotions. And we're seeing, for example, the British police at the moment trial this new kind of mood recognition system based on the face. 
So let's call that identity, location, and condition, this notion of uber valence that was created by my husband, M.G. Michael, and then this notion of access of access, the AXIS, the access of the accessibility of the data. Who has the right to access the information that's being collected with the facial recognition systems? So I'll leave it at that as a small introduction, Mark, and to say it's all about uber valence to me. I'm sure we'll be bringing that up again throughout the hour. Um, let's jump to, uh, to Michael next. Michael, if you could say a few words. You're on mute. Don't forget to unmute yourself, Michael. Yeah, so I got my introduction in the area of, uh, of biometrics uh, after going to work for the government. And back in 2002, I joined this group that was primarily looking at advanced technologies for securing the interface. Uh, and, and what that meant was uh, replacements for passwords. And so we were looking at all these various uh, biometric technologies, whether it was the face, the iris, or the, uh, or the fingerprint. Of course, around that time, uh, uh, just before, 9-11 uh, had occurred in the U.S. And there were ongoing questions about uh, could you use biometric technologies to help identify uh, terrorists in the future? And so, therefore, there began to be a lot of work in the area of uncontrolled. Uh, how do you deal with uncontrolled data, data that was never necessarily intended uh, to be used for authentication purposes? And, and throughout my career, that's, uh, that's pretty much the area that I, uh, that I worked in. And, and probably one of the largest projects uh, that occurred was at the uh, Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity. Uh, it was called the best program, not because it was the best program at IARPA, even though, you know, uh, based on the acronym it was. It was Biometrics Exploitation Science and Technology. Uh, and we took a look at speaker recognition, uh, some things in the area of advanced face recognition and iris, but beyond the iris, just looking at the entire uh, ocular region. And uh, today I find myself uh, trying to understand what's going on in the area of the demographic uh, variations and variability and, and what really causes these shifts uh, that we see sometimes in the false match rate uh, relative to uh, demographic influences such as race, skin tone, or, or gender. And so for the last uh, couple of years, those are the, uh, uh, the type of areas that we've been conducting research at the Florida Institute of Technology in collaboration with our, with our partner at the University of Notre Dame, Dr. Kevin Boyer, uh, has been in this particular space. Thank you, Michael. And uh, Risha, some thoughts from you. Yeah, uh, so uh, let me first start by thanking Mark and IEEE for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I'm really honored to be uh, uh, with everyone here. So uh, my journey in face recognition started around the year 2000. Um, at that time, the research community was primarily working on um, recognizing faces in controlled environment and uh, variations in pose, illumination, expression. And uh, since then, we have come a long way to identifying and verifying images, right? And um, now we can think of more challenging scenarios like surveillance and uh, other areas, more unconstrained applications in which uh, face recognition can be applied today. So uh, for the last few years, um, my lab has been working on extending the usability of face recognition to uh, more challenging and uh, problems like recognizing injured or surgically altered face images, recognizing faces with masks and disguises, low resolution images, um, and uh, matching sketches with digital images, uh, which is a very specific uh, law enforcement sort of scenario. And uh, along with this, uh, for the last two, three years, uh, we've also been working towards designing trustable and dependable face recognitions, uh, dependable face recognition systems. So under this, the key problems that we're working towards are uh, related to estimating and mitigating bias in face recognition algorithms. Uh, how do we ensure the security of face recognition systems, uh, security against uh, both digital and physical attacks? And, uh, and how do we provide privacy uh, to face images when they're uploaded on, uh, on web, on social media images? How can we ensure that face images are not misused for 
any other application for which it was not intention it was not uh, originally intended so uh, this is a brief overview of what uh, i'm doing right these days Thank you, Richa. And actually, that's a really good segue into the next part of our discussion, which is to talk a bit about what some of the concerns are uh, around this technology. I mean, you've all touched on some, some portions of that, um, particularly the sense of there being an initial uh, uh, problem that was trying to be solved. Uh, I mean, Michael brought up the example of passwords, you know, to, to improve password access uh, as an example. And from that has developed a whole host of other applications. And Risha, you, you said it um, quite well just a moment ago. How do, uh, how do we manage the, the technology in such a way that we ensure that it's being used for its intended purpose and not for other purposes? Uh, my question to each of you is, um, let's talk a bit more about some of those concerns and also talk about sort of where you draw the line between what's considered, what you would each consider um, uh, a, a reasonable use and what is sort of out of bounds for this technology. I'm interested in each of your opinions on sort of where to draw that line. Um, and, you know, we, anybody can jump in on that, feel free. I might begin, uh, Mark. Um, it's all about proportionality to me relative to the intent of which you're searching. Uh, is there a crime that has been committed, for example? It's a heinous crime. Is there a missing person? Uh, and that's proportional to someone's life. Where I see concerns is when we're almost using biometrics in the private scape so much that you enter a pub and your face is uh, scanned and then you are asked to be seated. So the GAO, of which uh, one of our Arizonan students at ASU uh, interned at, produced this wonderful report, GAO 20-522, which talks about the detection of an image. You know, you know there's a face in that image. Uh, there's a verification process perhaps when I'm checking my face against a mobile phone or there's identification taking place where you're in the public scape and you're basically searching and you're fishing for somebody but you're not so sure if they're in the crowd. Possibly you're hitting against a group of suspects or a number of suspects. So for me it's all about concerns to do with who has requested the biometric service where is the data being stored? Who has control of that? Going back to my opening comments, who has access? Who's requesting um, this service? And how does it work? Who is the controller, really? That's the, the fundamental thing. Then I move to privacy. Is this a facial recognition system that is covert and unobtrusive? I can't see it happening. For example, I see a sign that says, watch your head. But in actual fact, it's taking an oblique shot as I'm moving my head and reading that sign because I'm, I'm standing still for that split second where I'm being basically scanned without my knowledge. Particularly this happens at airports and shopping malls. So I think the shopping mall owner is concerned about my head being, you know, bumped, bumping into something. In fact, they're taking a lovely oblique shot of your face so they can match it against perhaps a marketing database saying you're a return customer. The other thing is this concern about body and location and information. Your face belongs to you. You can't change it unless you break your nose, you put on a lot of weight in a short period of time, or you somehow uh, change it in a way uh, that is going to bust that algorithm. So I'm worried about indiscriminate tracking and tracing, particularly these smart city initiatives that seem to be discriminatory against particular people, uh, perhaps First Nations or Aboriginal people. I'm worried about things like religious affiliation. We're seeing this with the Uyghur people in China. We're seeing this with dissidents in Hong Kong. We're even seeing this with the Muslim minority in Thailand in the southern border provinces. So fallibility of the systems, which was touched on by Michael and, and Richard, I'll finish there to say, well, we might have accuracy, but performance is still letting us down at times. Richard, Michael? Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks, Katina. I, I agree with what you suggested and what you uh, shared. So uh, I think it's difficult to draw a very specific boundary between uh, fair usage and, and uh, where you actually uh, use it and where you should not use it. I, I tend to associate uh, some of the intention also with 
proper usage of face recognition systems. Right. So if you're using it for law enforcement, for what kind of applications you are using it, right? Uh, if you're using a face recognition system for finding a missing child versus you are using it to track down somebody. Right. So uh, it's a it's a, it's a difficult question to be answered, but I think uh, one has to also consider within within a given setup within uh, what what kind of applications one is uh, using face recognition for. If you if I'm uploading my face images for social media, uh, can you use it for um, any kind of medical implications, any kind of medical diagnosis, or in any deriving anything uh, about my uh, personalities. So uh, one has to be careful and weigh in and weigh out of those uh, applications. A, a question to you, Richard. Um, do you think the same application that can be used to find the child and perhaps the persons uh, living with dementia who's wandering, do you think they can also be potentially misused? How do you see it? Do you see it by who's controlling things? I. See, the technology is the same, right? It's the face recognition technology. And uh, let's say if the technology is about identifying kids or the technology is about identifying elderly, it can be used across different applications. So uh, it very much depends on what is the specific problem we're using it for. And uh, it, it can be misused. It can be proper, used, put to very good use as well. So. Um, that is why I go back to my original comment on uh, what is the intention behind it, which is difficult to quantify, I understand, which is difficult to uh, um, note down very specifically, but uh, there, there is that angle to it as well, the way I see Michael? Yeah. Yeah, Mark, I, I agree with the, uh, with the panelists, is that this has been um, challenging for me to kind of draw this line as well, because you see so many positive uses of the technology, but, you know, it could also be abused. I mean, it's no different than um, a number of other technologies and instruments that, you know, we see used in everyday lives. I mean, you see, uh, I hate to use this uh, example because it's a hot button, but you you see things like guns. Uh, guns can be used to, uh, to hunt, to protect yourself, uh, but it can also be used against you. Uh, from a perspective of, uh, of face recognition technologies itself, uh, I personally would not necessarily want to be tracked via my face, you know, every single movement uh, that I make. But somehow I allow that capability to exist uh, when, I, uh, when I use my smartphone. Uh, pretty much a lot of the apps, you could give permission to track you in terms of your locations. Um, and maybe where where I would want to draw the line, though, is where a lot of this information is being pulled together in aggregate. And so maybe I go to one mall and that particular store can, you know, welcome me with a gift, even though I don't shop at the mall uh, that regularly. But, but if there was an application where you wanted to say, okay, because this is your 10th time this week, uh, just swinging by the, uh, the mall or 10th time this month, just swinging by the mall, we'd like to off you or a bigger discount somewhere. I, I could see uh, some folks coming up with applications like that if if they want to do that. I, I guess though, um, when you begin to draw these um, this these parallels of data and pull it together in, aggr in aggregate and and push it out to some other folks to say, at this particular point in time he likes to go to the mall. At this particular point in time he goes to this place, uh, and on every Tuesday. He eats lunch at this particular uh, place where you where you have that type of uh, pulling together. I think if if you if you you force me to, to draw the line somewhere, uh, I'd want to draw the line there. And I think the other place I'd like to draw the line is uh, use of the technologies to um, to pinpoint the locations of uh, kids who are doing nothing more than being kids. And so. It, and I understand those laws would actually vary in different parts of the world, right? Um, and so, so I think we also have to keep that in in mind as well. So let, let's stick with that uh, as a, as a segue. You mentioned um, uh, there being sort of different rules across the world. Um, you know, we, we're seeing. I know here in the U.S., we've seen some cities that have banned the use of facial recognition technologies for. Uh, you know, by government organizations. 
Um, the EU is considering a ban if they haven't already done so. I mean, there are, there are pockets of conversations around the world uh, around whether or not uh, this sort of technology is one that, um, uh, that local jurisdictions wish to make um, ubiquitous. Uh, so the, the question becomes, to me, uh, and this is actually a question that, that one of our registrants posed um, during the registration process, can we live in a world where there are some cities and some locations that use this technology and others that don't and, and how how compatible could an environment like that be is is it possible to to have to sort of draw that line between okay i i cross the street and um facial recognition is available here but where i'm standing right now it is not is that a compatible model where you have pockets of places where um there this technology is not allowed Uh, I think definitely, yes. Uh, even now, with respect to different kinds of technologies, there are variations, there are disparities among different, uh, between different continents, between different countries. So uh, even in this case, uh, disparity in the policies, different uh, disparity in the usage of technology, I think is very much feasible. One has to adapt to what kind of technologies uh, uh, is available, and if there is transparency in what, which country is using what, uh, are, are, is somebody using face recognition for tracking or surveillance, is somebody not using that? As long as that transparency is there, uh, it, it, I, I don't see a reason that it cannot coexist. So, Mark, I'd, I'd say, you know, when I was, uh, uh, when I was younger, not anymore, but when I was younger, um, you know, growing up in the uh, the Carolinas, uh, you know, we used to be allowed to have these things that were called uh, radar detectors if you were you know, had a propensity to speed or whatever. Uh, and those, you know, you could not have them in Virginia and certain other states. Um, and today, you have marijuana marijuana laws that you know, uh, in this particular jurisdiction of this particular state, uh, you're fine, and and in other jurisdictions, uh, uh, you're not. And so we have that type of variation as it stands now. And so, you know, I do believe there, there probably will uh, be some states that will outright ban uh, the use of the technology. Um, but, you know, I, let me also be clear is that, that I don't necessarily support wholesale bans. I, I do uh, support uh, regulatory controls being placed on the technology, um, but, I think going with wholesale bans just goes too far. I, I think there, there may be some instances where law enforcement, the only piece of evidence they have um, is, and it depends on how serious the severity of the crime, but the only piece of evidence that you may have may be a photograph and of an individual, and, and it may be a photograph of an individual's face. Um, and so if that's all you have to go on and there's a real need uh, to identify and find and identify this person uh, to prevent further loss of life or those types of things. Um, you know, there I think you always want to make sure that you have this particular capability in your toolbox uh, just in case it's necessary. Uh, and even if some states decide it's a last resort, it could be a last resort. Um, but, uh, but I do think you wouldn't want to uh, rule it out such as it's not in your toolbox to be used at all. Michael, that sort of lends itself to this uh, DNA experience we've had in the past, another biometric, the DNA, whereby we've talked about blanket coverage, these shocking numbers, like 38% of black ethnic minorities uh, have their DNA on the National DNA Register in the UK. And it's this shocking number, and the number of incarcerated as a result is actually also high of the BEM, the black ethnic minority. So we're almost talking about this do we go blanket coverage in case we might need in the 0.0000001% of the opportunity to have a photo is all we go on um, versus this thing of, well, we'll figure out another way. And so I, I look at the work of Evan Selinger, for example, who's been very outspoken with Woody Hartsock and many others about banning, for example, facial recognition on campuses uh, in certain states. And the question then becomes, how do you govern something like a ban? The complexity is perhaps not the ban, but the governance of that ban of 
Okay, so Clearview AI has gone and web scraped 3 billion images. Okay, now where were those images located? Do they all have location stamps? Where does that person reside? Um, and so what I want to say is that what we have today in markets like China and India, India, for example, with the ADA system, is a persistence, a ubiquity, and this pervasiveness, which is almost a total visibility. I can't walk outside my, my house in a smart city because I'll be screened, I'll be viewed, I'll be scanned. But who says? You know, who has the right to curb my freedom and my autonomy, my human rights as I go about my business during the day? And so these bans, I think, are warranted. We're seeing bans on 5G towers, for example, in parts of San Francisco. So I agree with uh, Richard that these exist. How do we deal with them when countries like China, they're open slather. They've got this AI 2030 vision that says, forget about your rights. You have no rights. We're going to surveil all of you. We're going to figure out who you are, where you go, where you frequent, who you're with, and then we'll determine what freedoms you have. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of going to the US going, at least you're doing something about it. The European Union has said no. Our GDPR, our general data our protection regulation says no. But then we're dealing with these other nations, particularly in Asia uh, and, and, in, and, and in India and so forth, that are allowing this blanket coverage surveillance. What are we going to do about that? Uh, just to clarify, Katina, uh, India is not doing blanket surveillance. We have Aadhaar, but it is not being used for law enforcement applications. It is only for social services right now. So uh, th just a clarification there that so, it is not being used for law enforcement right now. There is no blanket coverage or, uh, of so surveillance or anything like that. Richard, I, Richard, I'd go back to advocates of the legal uh, area who are basically saying it's being used to discriminate against gay, lesbian and queer people and transgender. It's being, it's not actually, it was never established with a legal basis before it was rolled out. It went to the High Court, it was challenged and there was an appeal process. I think we have to look at the rights of individuals in India. It's not just the face, it's multimodal and it's even been employers are even linking it, the ADA number, to the actual employee ID as a de facto to stamp out corruption. This was never in the legislation. And so I think law enforcement function creep determines that this will actually happen. I would say it's already happening. Look, as of now, there's a, there's a law against it. There's a policy document which uh, prohibits the usage of Aadhaar. I'm not saying it cannot be changed. But as of today, that is what it is. It has been approved by the parliament that it cannot be used for law enforcement, law enforcement applications. The standards that were designed for Aadhaar were also for e-commerce applications only. Law enforcement, uh, when you use uh, biometrics for law enforcement, generally the standards are also different. So uh, for Aadhaar, whatever standards are there in place are only for e-commerce applications. Right. So yeah. this, this is the state today. I would yes. say there is no legislation. There is no legislation supporting that. It's a policy. A policy is not law. And this is where we have to think about what is going is on law. in India. In India, there is a law. Aadhaar law is there. So um, this came after the fact. It was rolled out without a law there in the first place. I would challenge that notion because this is the problem that we have something rolled out, and then we say, "Oh, there is a law there," or we'll create the law after the technology is rolled out. But function creep. It was never designed to become the de facto employer ID or employee ID, and that is actually what is happening, to stamp out corruption. There are companies using the ADA system as an employee ID. This was happening three years ago. So this actually brings up a, a good point that um, one, of our, one of our attendees just raised. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about applications of this technology both from a, a government perspective as well as from a private sector perspective. And I think those are, those are different. So we, we were talking about both of those things in this conversation, right? Um, so somebody asked, you know, is there, is there a line between government use and private industry use and, and relative abuses? Um, the example they gave, you know, is, is, um, is the example they gave was, um, is, is an automated approach different from a person-based recognition like a, like a police lineup. So where do you, again, we talk about drawing lines, right? So where do you draw the line between law and policy? Where do you draw the line between government use um, and, and private use? And, and where, you know, is, is it okay in certain settings? Is it okay in private use but not government or vice versa, etc.? 
I mean, it's, it's obviously a complex issue, but it's one that I think is worth discussing. And I think, Michael, you, you wanted to add something to that. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that was my point. My, uh, uh, my point was when I was referring to the ban, I was really referring to the ban of use of this technology by law enforcement. Um, and, and not necessarily banning or, or not banning the use in terms of uh, by private companies or, or those types of things that, that want to use the technology for things like surveillance. Um, and, and so, and I think you can draw some distinctions there, but I think we have to be uh, careful when we began to talk about these wholesale uh, bans that apply to, to many different levels of government and, and different uses of the technology. I, I do still believe that there are technologies. Uh, there will be a time when you would want to use a technology like this. Um, and, and, uh, and, and when that exists, you don't want to have yourself in a box where you can't use it at all. Uh, it might be some additional uh, um, um, steps you have to take, additional measures you have to take. And, and in the U.S., the U.S. is pretty good at coming up with those. Um, with those, uh, I mean, I work in government, so I you know, can understand these different check boxes you have to check before you're able to do certain things. Um, and so, and I think that might apply here as well. Increasingly, Michael, we're seeing there's no alternate choice. I agree with you. Even in clubs and pubs in Australia, back in 2009, you know, you could actually go to a club as a, a citizen, a consumer, ask to go in, and if they said you have to have your fingerprint or your facial image taken, before you enter, you could actually say, could I see the manager? Could I have an alternate entry? Just take my driver's license perhaps and scan it, or here's my ID, you know, my state identification device. The question is when we tie biometrics to services that we all require, whether it's social services, uh, whether it's unemployment benefits, whether it's ration cards, whether it's even uh, to the point where we're looking at it for transactions. And I just look at China, WeChat, for example, and Alibaba now have intrinsically linked facial recognition to buying. And if that becomes the de facto and you cannot shop, you know, not holding a card, but just with your face, there is an issue with being locked in or locked out. And I get gravely concerned when there are no alternatives. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, about six months or so ago, um, one, one of my doctor's offices implemented a new biometric um, check-in process where uh, rather than signing your signature and check-in, you would put your hand uh, and, and you'd have, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a palm reading except you don't get a fortune after afterwards. And, uh, and, and I said, you know what, I'd rather not do that. And, um, and I was given the option to not do that. But, but it, it struck me immediately um, why would that be a necessary part of my check-in process for something that's worked fine for, forever? And I don't understand how my, my palm gets me in to see the doctor. Like that, I could not make the connection there um, in, in, any, in any way other than to think that it's, it's, it's some convenience that's being added. But the convenience is obviously not on the, on the user perspective it's on, or on the consumer side. It's on the, it's on the you know, organization side. Um, so, so Mark, maybe you enter the GP's office one day, they take a scan of your face and they go, you know what, Mark, you've got depression or you've got Noonan's syndrome or Turner's syndrome or you've got this syndrome you've never heard of and no one's ever told you. But guess what? The minute you walk in, the government knows, the insurance company knows, and so does your doctor. And they go, guess what? Mark Vasquez, this is what's happened to you. Or Katina Michael, you have this genetic disorder. It's like, whoa, you know, we're not thinking about this that we are going to discover things about our, our heritage, our people, our families, our friends, our relations, our, our groups of communities that we didn't know before because of facial recognition, and not just the face, but behavioral, right? Our emotions, how we're feeling, what we look like when we leave the house. Yeah. That was why I think control is important, giving the option to users. Do you want to sign in? or not, right? As long as you have that control, that, that permission should lie with the customer, with the consumer. It should not be a ban for all or no ban at all, right? So, uh, so we need uh, to, to figure that out. One of, the big, one of the big takeaways I'm getting from this, and it was something that, that Michael mentioned, is this idea of 
of it being something that's in your toolbox. Right? So it's, it's something you have access to, uh, but isn't so pervasive that nobody has an option to opt out of it, especially in, in the context of, uh, or, or, or especially in a situation where the scanning of your face is not relevant to a, let's say, a, a criminal investigation. We're just capturing all this just in case we need it at some point, as opposed to, okay, we need to locate this person. Let's now try to find them. Um, so I, I think the, 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 the nugget I'm getting from, from what Michael said and from what I think both you, Richa, and Katina are agreeing is that it's, it's really the, the line, as we talked about before, is really should exist at the point where um, the application is being used, um, where there's a, 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 an identified need and um, a, an explicit approval of use of the technology, as opposed to it just being there all the time, just in case, sort of like just throwing out a net and just keeping it out there. Um, and I mean, it's, it's a very weird analogy, perhaps, of what just crossed my mind in using the net concept is, you know, if you're going fishing for, uh, uh, for tuna and you're, cap you're catching dolphins and everything else along the way, then, you know, maybe you're doing it wrong. And maybe that's where the line gets drawn. Um, I, I want to ask one quick question because, you know, I think for a lot of people, I, I do think a lot of people, especially the general public, think of facial rec as something new, something trendy, something that's, that's sort of modern, but it's actually been around for a while and, and, and biometrics in general have been around for a while. Um, how have you all seen the, the evolution of the technology uh, to the point where it is something that's on everybody's radar screen, so to speak? and where we are having this conversation. I mean, obviously the technology has been around for a while. We weren't really talking about this 10, 20, even five years ago. Um, why is it, what has changed that has made this conversation an important one for us to have now? Michael, did you want to jump in on that or reach any? Yeah, I, I think um, many years ago, you needed you know, specialized hardware equipment to be able to run um, you know, to be able to run a probe image through very large databases and galleries. Um, and it took a considerable amount of effort. Um, the technology has improved over the years. I mean, you know, in the, uh, in the early 2000 timeframe, you really needed a, it worked best when you had a, a frontal uh, facing image. Uh, around 2005, there was like the NIST Grand Challenge um, that, was, uh, that was part of the face recognition vendor test. Um, and then from that point forward, if you look around the later uh, 2008, 2009 timeframe, there was a push uh, to improve the, the, uh, the ability of these technologies to um, be highly accurate on non-ideal data. Um, and then you had, you know, this introduction of the convolutional neural networks. And so, you know, folks needed large amounts, large volumes of data to be able to train these things. And so, um, in, in, you know, in running programs, that's one of the things that you, you typically find. Like when you had an algorithm developer that was looking to develop an algorithm, one of the things, the first thing they needed to do was collect some data or something. Um, and then you had this proliferation of technology where everybody had a camera in their hand. They were taking pictures and now you got to put this in place. So they put it online. And so when you put it online, wait, wait, there's a, there's a great place to go and collect data because I can collect millions of samples of data. Uh, at low, very little cost, whereas if I was to go through a proper procedure of doing this through an institutional review board, uh, you know, I may get 100 people. It would cost me a lot of money, and I'd have very few samples. But, but a lot of this data is just out there and available now. Uh, and, and I think in, if it's publicly available, that's what uh, a lot of these algorithm vendors are, are pretty much saying. I mean, that's, that's what they're using, or maybe they're using uh, data from uh, some of the operations where they've actually uh, um, sold data to some, uh, sold the, the capability to uh, some organization in exchange. They get to use that data to improve the performance of their algorithms. And so, and I think that's why uh, when you have this proliferation, I think it this, I can't remember exactly when it started, but when you had things like Facebook tagging, uh, people uploading images, and then they put a nice little box around and say, this is, this is uh, uh, Mike King or something. Um, when you begin to have that, I think that's when a lot of this discussion began. Um, but now you have this continued evolution of the technology 
and the evolution of capabilities associated with it, which is now driving a large part of this uh, this conversation. Now you can search very large quantities of of uh, of, uh, of images uh, and faces in very short periods of time, and you have readily available access to computing resources to do it. And so, so I think that's uh, in a nutshell. I think very that's uh, that's pretty much what's been driving a lot of this conversation. I agree, Michael. And we've also seen uh, the introduction of these algorithms in the form of software placed on current CCTV cameras. So low resolution to mid-range resolution cameras can now function incredibly well with the software on board. So we're investing in the algorithms and the software and updating the firmware in these CCTV cameras effortlessly by the algorithms that we're creating. And they're doing things like real-time tracking. So we've had this CCTV infrastructure growing over time. All we're doing is updating the firmware, the software that's embedded in these devices. The other thing we're doing is we're not actually relying on the whole facial image to be taken and captured. All we want are the points. I was listening to one guru from the autonomous vehicle space saying, you know, you're going to enter a ride share. The minute you sit down, we're just going to take a, a map of your face. Forget about the image. We don't want your image. So they're flogging this off as if it's not really your image we're taking. We're just taking these dots of a profile which is utter bogus. They're actually taking your profile image and extracting it and then processing it in the cloud, wherever it may be, even in the vehicle. We're starting even to talk about tiny machines now. The, the question is, when are we going to get real with the consumer? Because I, I am going to go back to Ubervalence, this, this packing and this density of, as you said, these proliferated cameras everywhere, but also this location stamp, this time stamp, this magnetometer, accelerometer, altimeter, all of these sensors coming on board. And we're using the mobile, the storage, and the speed of processing to actually get this stuff out. But we're doing this effortlessly by simply updating the current infrastructure that we have with software. It's very much software driven. So I just want to call out, they may not be taking our image, but they're taking the dots which actually create the profile of our face. And so I want us to actually gain the true consent from the consumer. We, we are not photographing you. No, 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 we're not. But we're taking every single darn point of your face and we're going to keep it somewhere. And that's a problem to me. Richard, before we go to you, and I, I want you to speak on this as well, I, I wanted to mention something that um, a, a, an attendee mentioned online, which is directly related to something that Katina mentioned just now, where... Um, someone said it's also interesting how for many years stores, airports, construction sites, etc. were and still are conducting video surveillance and yet no one raised a red flag and that was an equal invasion of privacy. And to Katina's point, that technology is now being upgraded. Um, basically this new technology is, 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 um, is being added on top of what that, that existing infrastructure already. So uh, uh, you know, there are folks who are mentioning that online, how you know that the, the infrastructure that's being used for this Uber valence, as, you, as you've coined it, um, Katina, was already there, and nobody was questioning it then, and now it's being used in, in this way. Aricha, I, I wanted you to chime in as well. Um, infrastructure is definitely one of the reasons, but it's also the uh, emergence of these algorithms. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of these deep learning algorithms, right? They, these are uh, very powerful, and uh, the technology, the, Infrastructure has been there. We have been able to capture these videos and everything, but uh, the capability to automatically process them, to do any kind of automated surveillance or tracking or recognition was not there earlier to this extent, to this uh, efficiency where we have reached now, right? And again, uh, all of this goes together. Availability of hardware, availability of data, like Michael said earlier, we are taking a lot of data from the web to uh, to improve the performance of our algorithms and the the, the capabilities of these algorithms also increasing. So it, it's a very uh, it's it's an integration of all of these together that has come into the, come uh, that has become available, which is actually driving the performance these days. And another thing which I think is the technology is now with people. So I can use my phone today to do a face recognition. Right, and when I can actually use uh, to perform face recognition on a day-to-day -day basis, on an hourly basis, to open my phone using my face images, that is when the actual I, as a user, get more familiarized 
with the limitations of the technology. When I search my face on Google and what I find, what I don't find, because that is now coming to, to individual users like us. We, we are getting, uh, we are becoming a bigger and bigger consumers of technology. So, so when so many people are using, uh, the, the challenges, the limitations of those are also coming to the picture. So I think uh, it's uh, the availability of these along with the increasing usage, which is bringing the challenges to surface. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity to fix all of this. We can, we can work towards, now that the challenges are identified, are slowly getting identified. I'm not saying that we have identified all of them. We're slowly uh, figuring out, we're slowly realizing what are the limitations, right? Once we realize that, we can work towards solving them, both computationally as well as uh, in policy making and other things. So I think it's an integration of all of this, which is, um, which is bringing all of this to the customers and consumers. And that's Richard, really what, what, sorry, Mark, I just wanted to ask a question of Richard. What do you think about deep fakes and how they'll mess around with our analytics? Uh, can you repeat that, Katina? Yes, Richard. Uh, what do you think about deep fakes, the images that are fake, they're not of real people? Do you think they will enter our systems? And what is the, the, the complexity and the challenge there? See, uh, earlier uh, Mike mentioned about the availability of technology and it could be used for anything, right? Deep fake is one of the problems I'm currently working on. With, with every technology that is improving, deep fakes are also improving, right? So, so there may be, uh, we, we are getting very, very good at it. And uh, it, it might be a matter of time that, uh, that technology uh, creates problems for face recognition algorithms. Right. So uh, while while we are improving the fake, we have to improve this as well. So it's a, it's a continuous process, right? One one technology improves, the adversary also improves. So uh, so we have to continuously be at it and uh, work to it. So I'm I'm cognizant of the time, and I want to make sure that uh, we we get to some of the other points we wanted to cover today. I wanted to mention to those of you who are watching us live that. Um, I did mention we would be having Q&A towards the end, but it turns out that I've been taking some of your questions throughout the conversation. Uh, so it, 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 it was a lot, um, a lot less um, compartmentalized as I initially anticipated. Uh, so I wanted you all who are online to know that uh, we've been asking some of your questions throughout the conversation. One of the things I wanted to, there are two things I wanted to get to. I hope we have enough time. I, I don't want to go over time. Uh, there were two things I wanted to get to. One was a segue from the conversation we were just having which was, which is, and I think it was based on something Richa just said, uh, we were talking about now that we know the issues, now that we know the challenges, we now need to work on addressing them. So I'll put both questions out there. I'll pose the first one. The first one is, um, how do we address those concerns? Who's responsible for it? You know, what, what process do we need to, to manage this now that we know what some of the challenges are? That's question number one. And question number two is, um, I also wanted to make sure that, that we acknowledge the fact that there are some um, beneficial applications of this technology, right? We've spent a lot of time talking about some of the issues and challenges, and we've touched on some of the, the, um, the positive uses of them. Um, somebody online gave an example um, when I mentioned the, the palm print. They said, well, actually, from their perspective, they believe that, that some biometric ID is much more reliable from a, a patient perspective than others, than just simple checking in, because you 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 run the risk at times of having the wrong patient oper, um, operated on based on something that they checked in on manually. Whereas if you had used the biometric, there's no way you could have confused that patient. So I, so there are places where where the application of the technology is truly beneficial. Um, so I wanted to address both of those very quickly as we start to wrap up, just reminding folks where some of these beneficial applications are, and then knowing that there are challenges, um, how do we address those challenges? So if, if you could, if all three of you could answer both of those sort of in a, in a minute or less, um, that would be great. I'm just going to start really quickly, mention an article by Evan Selinger on deep natural anonymization. How do you take a face and it's protect photo is the app. I actually take the facial image I distort it using some digital uh, doppelganger and I basically spoof it up a bit to protect it so you can't identify, it's anonymized, and then you can go ahead 
uh, and do this. This is a Berlin startup that created this particular application. So, Katina, what did you think of my two questions, though? The sort of the beneficial uses, and then how do we how do we help regulate? It's all about communities, and it's all about co-design. You know, you have to ask your constituency, what do you want? Does this warrant the requirement of facial recognition? You know, I'm not saying ban facial recognition for particular types of applications. What I'm saying here is, are we speaking to consumers and citizens? Have we informed them before we go ahead and roll out a system that affects them in real time? And we are not giving ourselves room. So the benefit for me is, let's talk to the communities that we're going to impact with this technology. Do they want it, is the question. And what, what level of uh, uh, pervasiveness do they want it to? I, I think what we're thinking about is one size fits all, and I, I don't think that it can. On the benefits side, of course, I'll go back to my opening comments about proportionality and who has control. It's this axis of access. You know, is it just the CIA? Is it just, you know, the, the corner store, the shopping mall? Is it just my school? Who has the access? What's their intent? And what's the context? So I think context matters, as we've always said, and embedding those important privacy and security by design principles in the actual system to begin with, like those safeguards that Evan has pointed to, you can create a safe system to protect an individual. What I'm worried about is we're doing this open slather at the moment with no safeguards in place, with no checkpoints, no checks and balances and going, she'll be right. Actually, she won't be. We're going to enter into another world that we have no control over our own property, which is our, our image. You know, who owns information, as Anne Branscombe said so long ago? Who owns your face? You do, nobody else. Richa, Michael? Uh, so I would say that um, it, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a million dollar question, right? The one that you have asked. So uh, we use it, uh, I, I agree with Katina that people have to be involved. The users of the system have to be involved in uh, for whom you are going to use the technology. But we also need to educate uh, let's say we, are, we decide to uh, apply for law enforcement uh, applications. We also need to educate the people, the users, that what are the limitations of the system, not only the functioning, but also the limitations, so that they can make informed decisions in which, in, in which scenarios, in which environments it works, and in which environments it doesn't work. Uh, we briefly alluded to false accepts and false rejects and all of that, right? So a system should not have a unified uh, uh, universal false except false reject rates. It, it, is, it varies according to different environments, different people, different subgroups and applications. So one should be made aware of all of these before we go on to implement this so that the, the applications, the usage is justified and usage is done in a proper manner. If my face recognition system does not work in low resolution environments, I should not rely on the, on the results that the system is generating. So that kind of knowledge of the system is important, not only the technology, not only the IT professionals should know, but people who are working in the field, even they should be aware of where it should be applied, where it should not. When should I rely on the results and when I should not, right? So, so that kind of understanding is very important for any technology, including face recognition. And uh, regarding the applications that you mentioned, uh, I think there are several applications, positive face recognition, uh, uh, positive applications of face recognition, including in the medical community, entertainment industry, for, for convenience of users. So if, if I'm using it to open um, my phone, in uh, it, it, it is helpful, right? If, rather than using fingerprint, if I can use uh, uh, my face images, particularly in this time of COVID, where uh, we, we are concerned about touching something making contact when where fingerprint palm print can be used versus face provides that level of convenience right so uh, there are benefits to the technology and there are positive applications but one has to understand uh, where we want to apply it what is the consumer base and what is the performance my technology is giving for that application and for that population So Mark, to your first question, in terms of answering, uh, addressing the challenges, uh, the big part of this is really openness because we don't live in a monolith. And so for every person that 
you know, for every mean that would be out there and say, well, you know, I, I support the deployment of the technology and responsible uh, manage, there'll be another person that says they don't. And sometimes when I speak publicly, I, I give this example of, you know, if, um, if for some reason I happen to be wrongfully arrested um, as a result of some false match that occurred with face recognition, I'll be probably the first one marching to some city hall somewhere saying ban the technology completely. Uh, but if the following week somebody hits me across the head as I'm pumping gas at, a, at some convenience store and the only thing you have is an image, I'll be right back down to city hall saying, give me that technology I need it to try and identify this person. Um, and so we're going to have these conflicting and, and uh, these conflicting views that somehow we have to develop a compromise uh, around. But the way you do that, I think, is by having a diverse panel. I historically, I've primarily just been in the technology aspect, uh, dealing with the technology aspect of it, uh, not so much on the policy and the ethics and the regulatory uh, realm. But if we're going to address this, um, you know, and I guess the other thing is that. Um, technology developers and innovators are not going to sit around and wait on permission uh, to develop the next new thing. They're just not. Um, and it's not even smart to do so from an innovator's perspective. Um, but there has to be a, a, an awareness and, and, uh, and eyes upon the technology development arena to try and help, help ensure that those technologies aren't deployed in means or are used for um, um, in ways that, you know, is not beneficial to the public. Um, and the, the last one, in terms of the benefits, I mean, face recognition has been successfully uh, uh, deployed in, in areas in terms of helping to identify and, and mitigate sex trafficking. Um, uh, border security, I mean, if you just take border security, the only way that I can actually unequivocally say uh, that this particular course, person crossed this threshold it's with the biometric. It's not with someone flashing an ID uh, of some picture that was taken eight, nine years ago uh, and, and saying, I'm, you know, I'm coming from a different country or, or something along those lines. It is with the biometric. And so there are going to be beneficial uses of the technology. Um, we just have to, uh, to figure out how to balance that with uh, the respect and privacy of the, uh, of the public at large. It's interesting, okay. Mike, because uh, you know, just quickly, really quick, we're running at the really top. Quick. Yeah. Amazon, IBM, and Microsoft—they've stopped, right? They, the tech companies are responding to consumer outcries here. IBM, Microsoft, Amazon—they have ceased their algorithm development in this space. So I do want to say there has been a technology response by the tech companies. And actually, that was a, a, a good segue into our wrap-up at the very end. We're coming up at the top of the hour. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and that is to say that one of the reasons uh, why we believe that programs like the IEEE Tech Ethics Program are important is that it does exactly what Michael, I think, was alluding to, bringing um, these disparate and diverse groups of people together to have these conversations so that these decisions and these conversations don't rest solely on the shoulders of any one group. So it's not solely on the shoulders of the technologists to do this, nor solely on the shoulders of the policymakers, et cetera. Um, you know, somebody mentioned online that, 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 Michael, you touched on the key aspect of this, that, you know, just being involved in the technology side, that's not where your focus is. Um, and what we do want to do is make sure that, that the folks in the technology space at least have an awareness um, and, and, and have, um, are including this in their thought process. But to your point, Michael, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's ultimately your responsibility to, to regulate it all um, either. So one of the things that we, we try to do through programs like Tech Ethics is to bring groups like the three of you together to have these conversations and hopefully build these communities, build this sort of ongoing conversation around these topics. So for those of you who are watching online, if these kinds of conversations are the, the type that interest you, um, Feel free to follow us. I, I will include in, in the chat a, a link to our website um, that has information on uh, how you can join our community, um, how you can watch previous conversations, how you can enlist um, in, in other activities across the IEEE in this space. I do want to mention briefly before we end that um, the work that we do here is brought to you in part by a grant that we have received from the IEEE Foundation. They've been great partners for us in this, so I want to make sure to give them a shout out. Um, 
once this session is over, um, you will all be receiving a brief survey. So we ask that you please uh, spend some time, very brief, maybe five question survey uh, on today's conversation. And then finally, I just want to uh, thank each of the panelists again for, for joining us for this great conversation. I know we could have gone on much longer than this. And unfortunately, Richa, I do not have the million dollars to give you in your response to the million dollar question. Um, but I, I do want to thank uh, Katina Michael, Michael King, and Richa Singh for joining us today. Um, and with that, I will say thank you all for joining us and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Mark, for having us.